from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. darkness of night we come face to face with our own thoughts and our own feelings, for we are alone. In the night we can catch glimpses of what aloneness means, for it means many things. Loneliness is one of them. We try to light up the night in order to banish our fear of loneliness. We smile. We pretend. We talk a blue streak in an effort to hide our feelings. Surrounded by people, by the wrong people, we are lonelier than ever. try to escape from aloneness into sleep. But when real or imagined terrors prod us into alertness, the sleeplessness itself becomes a source of fear. But aloneness does not have to be loneliness and fear. It can be privacy. Night hours can be used to make the day longer and richer. But for people like Carol and Cram, aloneness seems like punishment. It means being shut off in solitude with her pain and her misery. Aloneness can be exile, the feeling we've been deserted by the people we need. For if the world of strangers disappears for the night, we are usually left with the people who mean most to us. The night is a family time. It's stillness broken by family sound. Don can forget it while he still hears it. Mary can react to it without quite hearing it. What's the matter, Tommy? What's the matter, boy? You are a little worn. No, no, don't cry. There are ordinary things to do about ordinary trouble. 
but doing is a way of striking out against troubles that may be worse. Okay, Stevie. Now drink up and go back to sleep. can mean being alone with one's family. The night can be a time to reshift and rebalance the burdens of responsibility. Not fear, we say, just worry. Stop worrying, we tell each other. Go to bed. Everything will be all right. We say it for strength. We say it for love. We say it to fight anxiety. The anxiety is born of our past and will live in our future. For our inner thoughts at midnight arouse feelings that are always with us. Aloneness merely stirs them up. Night. Night is only the other half of day. And for Carolyn, who lives across the street, it has been a bad day. And so tonight is a bad night. If I could only sleep, maybe my headache will go away by morning. Well, how will I ever get to work? I've got to sleep. Maybe one pill isn't enough. A few more couldn't hurt me any. Maybe I can forget Mac if I sleep. But I shouldn't hate him. It wasn't his fault. He only found out the truth about me. For a little while I fooled him. He was so wonderful, so smiling. I used to feel smiling, too. How stupid I was. How stupid. <laughs> but there comes a time when we have to quiet the painful memories and the bitter echo of our shame. Befuddled, hungry, unaware, we reach out for the relief of oblivion. We emerge from aloneness as the light returns. Day is a time for coming together, for work and action. We become people with jobs. Jobs in which we must use our hands and our heads. We emerge from aloneness as the light returns. Day is a time for coming together. The Duns live on Elliot Street. No anxiety now, just irritation. Stevie's afraid that the whole thing may be called off. But while Tommy's fever is gone, he's not well enough to go on an outing. But then suddenly, everything is all right again. King Baby has given permission. They're off. No, not quite. 
grill for the hot dog. Stevie's glad to have something to do, to make it happen. This is the day he's been waiting for, for months, it seems to him. The Duns are off on a simple Sunday picnic. This can be a park, an ordinary Sunday, an ordinary family. Or it can be something much more important. It can be an Indian hollow, a tribe on the move to a new encampment, an exciting day that may forever leave its mark on a young, impressionable human. An ordinary man on his day off may really be a rival fisherman with all the skills Stevie dreams of having himself someday. Daddy can turn into a chief in charge of setting up the camp. that he should begin to feel trustworthy as a result? We all like learning to do new, important things. We all like being treated as equals. We all like the feeling of belonging around the fire. So a picnic can be a big thing in our lives, a thing by which we grow into our place in the world, or more important still, grow up and out. Growing is never easy. Growing is never done without some danger, some fear, and some courage. Fun to be strong and confident, fun to be admired. There's no growing without the risk of fear, the fun of licking it. grows, he learns to live with other people. The people who feed him, who teach him discipline, who love him. As he learns his place in the group, he can also come to appreciate theirs. And with such security inside them, Kathy and Stevie can make their way in the fascinating world beyond their parents' apron strings. for help, for cooperation, for parenthood. There are many things that remain difficult until fingers are longer or until the problems are understood. It's all a part of growing, 
of learning the things that other men have learned. And not just men, but women too. Cheating a little girl out of the fun doesn't help make her more ladylike. You feel many things and think many thoughts when you fish. It's a time for dreaming and a time for imagining. A quiet, peaceful time. Yes, a picnic can be a big day with everyone growing, everyone sharing the love, the warmth, the oneness that all people need and want. Such minutes in childhood help us grow to the fullness and richness of which we are all capable. Such minutes in childhood save months and years of hungry searching in later life. But some of us have a different kind of childhood. Because our inner needs for love and appreciation have not been fed, we frantically keep trying to satisfy them, suffering loneliness in the midst of people, in the light of day. Carolyn Cram is such a person. Would you like to tell me what you're thinking about? Nothing. Nothing? My mind is a blank. I noticed the pattern on the carpet. I don't like it very much. It reminds me of a carpet in my room. It gives me the heebie-jeebies. The one in my room, I mean. It's old and worn out. My mind keeps wandering. So many things go in and out. Like what? Oh, I don't know. Clothes, office, business, I don't know. I'm not really thinking about them. They're gone before... I really can't tell you about them. There's nothing to tell. I'm sorry. You're about 15 minutes late today. Let's talk about that for a minute. I was held up at the office. That's the only reason? Yes. Except that I missed a bus. I ran, but I missed it. Perhaps you didn't want to come. Oh, but I did want to come. Well, you know I did. I got here, didn't I? A little late, but I got here after all. After all what? After all the delay, the business at the office and, and the bus. It wasn't my fault. Of course I wanted to come. Why shouldn't I want to come? Maybe you don't like talking to me. Oh, I do. Usually. But not today. I've nothing to say today. Nothing important, anyway. Do you think you have to talk about important things? It's so stupid. I'm not having anything to say. I feel like a fool. Why? Oh, I'm so boring. I really don't see why you go on wasting your time with me. I haven't got anything to say that would be of interest to someone like you. Everything you say interests me.
Well, you said you enjoyed talking to me. I didn't think anyone would ever say that to me. First time Carolyn has cried in all the weeks she's been telling me about herself. She never cried when she talked about her childhood or about the death of her mother when she was six years old. She never admits even now that she missed the mother. It was an experience left in the air, never worked through or worked out, never understood. She says there was something wrong with her even then, something different. Even in the years when Mr. Cram tried to be both father and mother. I didn't really appreciate him, I guess. It should have been the best time of my life. She had him all to herself, except for the job that supported them both. She remembers breakfast was a time for holding on, for trying to prevent his daily departure. Over and over again, she tells me that she loved her father and that he loved her. But every morning she was frustrated by his inevitable leaving. Every morning she suffered through the fact that he was all that she had to fulfill her inner needs. And so now at 25, she still thinks of love as something that should cause suffering. During school vacations especially, the day was a vacuum 10 hours long. I didn't like to play with other children because I wasn't like them. It seemed safer and more comfortable to stay around the house. So her days were ten hours of the pain she tries even now to dismiss with the phrase, I guess I was lonely. For even now she can't admit hating him for leaving her alone. Nothing else mattered to her but his coming and going. Nothing else could hold her interest or divert her hunger. She feels somehow that she deserved this kind of torture. But why, she doesn't know. For she remembers nothing of the guilt she felt in connection with her mother's death. Nothing of her confused feelings about her father. She can't remember those feelings because she doesn't want to remember them. They are too painful to remember, too close to the core of her trouble. This is how affection came to be mixed up in the pattern of her feelings with pain and guilt and resentment and loneliness. She had hours to practice the art of feeling deserted, the penalty for having a man all to herself. Actually, she had nothing to herself, for her inner needs were unsatisfied and becoming twisted. Nothing was real for Carolyn but loneliness. But even ten hours can come to an end. Father never stopped on the way home. I can still remember the sound of his steps on the driveway. The joy of being set free from my cage of loneliness. They seem like good days now. Her father would come home from his job. But this love is mixed up with sore throats and fever and the smell of medicine. Pain and balm are all confused in her mind. And Carolyn also remembers a special day. A day when her father was excited and upset. She had known the day was coming. They had talked about it, but not very much. I guess he was afraid of hurting my feelings.
She remembers trying to quiet him down that morning, to reassure him. She was trying to behave grown up, to act the little lady, as she had promised she would act on that special day. And he, in turn, had promised not to be away long. He would be back in less than an hour. He kept his word. He was back from the station in 40 minutes with the woman who was to be his new wife. As he said, Carolyn's new mother. But Carolyn didn't see why she needed a mother, especially now that she herself had become a little lady. Why did her father want another lady? Why? I don't know why I had to run. I don't know why I couldn't answer. I don't know why I wanted to cry or why I couldn't cry. He didn't want me anymore. I wasn't his little lady. I'll never be a lady. She admits she didn't like the woman who was to be her stepmother. But she doesn't want to talk about her feelings toward her father that afternoon. I felt sad, like when my cat died. But this time I couldn't cry. I was too sad to cry. He told me I'd her and that she would love me. But I didn't want her to love me. Nobody could love me. Nobody but my father. And now it seemed he didn't either. Hours later, her father found her and took her home. Carried her home in his arms, lovingly, like other days. Well, she didn't look like me. I told you she was so short. Well, maybe that's what shies yourself. Your height bothers you. You've always worried about it. You know, now that you mention it, I think you're right. I think I was a little girl in the dream. Then I was the one that, that threw the stone in the window. Of course it was me. Funny. But I feel better now. Do you? Why? I don't know exactly. So that heavy feeling is all gone. You know, I don't understand. The dreams don't mean anything to me, and then you just say a word or two, and suddenly everything becomes perfectly clear. It's, it's as though you knew me better than I know myself. Do you really think so? Sometimes I do. And I know that you can help me if you want to. I want to. Well, like telling me what to do about this new boy. I don't know whether you think I should go out with him or not. Do you want to go out with him? Oh, I don't know. I'm not sure. I'm afraid that it'll all happen again the way it did with Mac. Why? Oh, it always does. Why does it? I don't know. I guess I... Don't pick the right boy, or I'm no good at holding him, but I don't know. It's always a mess. It doesn't have to be. Well, is this the right boy for me? Am I right for him? I've told you all about him. Yes, you have. Well, should I or shouldn't I? I don't know. Why do you say you don't know? First, I get the idea you want me to go out with other boys, and... Now, suddenly, I have the feeling you don't want me to go out with this one. Did I say not to go out with him? No, but you didn't say I should. Somehow, I have a feeling that you don't approve. You think I... 
haven't made up my mind and that I don't know whether I like him or not. But you think I'm still afraid. Did afraid. I say that? No. But I know that you feel it. And it's true. I am afraid. Afraid? We're all afraid to begin with. For the world is strange. Full of strange and curious things that can be seen, felt, and pushed around. We get over our fear as we come to know the things and the people around us for what they are. We all learn in time that we're not threatened, that the world is a safer place than we think. People can be friends. Objects can be used for having fun, for gain an increasing sense of our own confidence and strength. For a seven-year-old, doing the household chores can be fun for the same reasons. It is further proof of her growing strength, her ability to take care of herself. Being able to help her little brother makes her feel still stronger. For the feeling of strength develops in time. Problems that are tough one year are easy the next. Our abilities and talents grow as we use them. That is how we grow up. Adding strength to strength. Multiplying our powers. Until we can use them for ourselves and for others. The road to maturity is fun when it's smooth. It's fun to do things, to have things, to make things. But growing up isn't always fun. Some things are hard to learn. Especially things that involve other people's ideas or other people's needs. fighting. <coughs> Kathy, I think it's time you help mother set the table for dinner, honey. Stay with daddy a minute, huh? What do you think you and Kathy fight so much lately? Why do you think? Because I want a room for my own. Oh. Well, we'll probably have a room for you someday. We just need a bigger house. Maybe we could build a room for you, huh? What would you like in the room? My frames and my drawers. Oh, well, your drawers. That's a good idea. And a bed. Would you need your bed? Yeah. Well, will you want a room just all to yourself? You're not going to share it with anybody? Uh-oh. No? Not Kathy? Or Tommy? Yeah, Tommy. Well, you're going to share it with Tommy? Yeah. But not Kathy? Uh -oh. oh, aren't you ever going to let her into your room? Maybe. For a visit, but not when I'm playing. Well, that sounds very interesting. But I think we better plan pretty carefully. How about you getting to work on a model? What's that? Oh, that's a make-believe room where you can see how things work out. How can I do that? Well, there's plenty of wood down by the porch. Just get to work on it, see what happens. Well, 
Doesn't that look nice? I certainly am lucky to have such a sweet big girl to help me. You really are a help, Cassie. After dinner, you could bathe Tommy, too. Tommy never cries when I bathe him. Well, of course not. That's because he knows you love him. You do, don't you? Mm-hmm. But I don't like Stevie. I hate Stevie. You do? Why? Because he's a brat. Because he's always getting in my way. Well, that's because boys don't do quiet things like girls do. Sewing, for instance. We always feel better when we've expressed our feelings to another person. Especially if we like that person and feel that that person likes us. It can be anyone we respect and trust. It can be a father or a mother, a teacher or a minister. And for Carolyn, who couldn't really talk to her father, it is now a doctor. That story I told you about that party at Liz's house the other night, and about that boy, it wasn't true. I made it all up. And about that book I brought you last week, that was a lie, too. It hasn't been in the family for years. <clears throat> Just bought it at a second-hand store. Yes. Isn't that terrible? Why do I do things like that? Why do I go on lying to you? How can I ever expect to get any good out of all this if I don't tell you the truth? Maybe you had a reason for lying to me. What kind of a reason? You tell me. I don't know. I guess maybe I just wanted to impress you. Why would you want to do that? I don't know. I guess maybe it has something to do with all this trouble I've been having lately. Not being able to eat, not sleeping. I seem to be upset about something, but I don't know exactly what it is. By the way, did you have time to read the book? No, I didn't. I've been very busy. Oh, have you? But I hope to get to it this weekend. It looks very interesting. Oh, it's probably nothing. It's probably not very good. But you did say you were interested in the Civil War, didn't you? Yes, I did. Um, this uh, thing that I'm afraid of, I think it began about two weeks ago, maybe more. Um, I'm sorry about the party. I wanted to go, and I got dressed for it, and then... I don't know. I was afraid that I wouldn't have a good time. You said that I shouldn't go if I didn't want to. And so instead, I went to a movie all alone. Isn't that terrible? No, I don't think so. Did you enjoy the picture? Yes, but... But you said that I should go out more, that I should mix with people. I don't understand. I don't seem to be getting any better at all. Do you want to get better? But of course I do. Certainly I do. I can't go on like this. What do you mean, like this? Coming to see you every week. Getting treatment. I've got to get better. Is that what's bothering you? Yes, of course. Except that... in a way, I'll be sorry. Sorry? I'll be sorry not to see you anymore. I've gotten used to you. Don't you understand? You're the only person I can really talk to. It's different with Gracie Kent and the Robertsons and Mary. They're very nice, they're friends, but... I can't talk to them like I can talk to you. So maybe you're right. Somehow I feel you're right that this awful way I've been feeling has something to do with what we're talking about. I feel different now. I feel like smiling. I'm sorry. 
I won't lie anymore. I'll try to work it out, like you say. I'll do anything, only... You won't... I won't what? You won't let me go before I'm well, will you? You don't let patients go before they're better, do you? No. Please don't do that with me. Please don't leave me right in the middle. Why do you think we might stop? Because I get mixed up and do the wrong things. You'll get tired of it all. Do I seem to be tired of it? No. I'm sorry, only... I need you. I need to talk to you. I'm scared. I'm scared it'll be like it was with Mac. Maybe I lied to Mac, too. Maybe that's why it all happened. She can tell me she needs me now, because she trusts me. She's no longer shy. The words she used to describe her feelings on the night of the Y dance. Shy about meeting people. Shy about their seeing through her and not liking her. Her friends couldn't understand the pain of her shyness. They couldn't understand why she said she wanted to meet people but tried to run away from them when she had the chance. She couldn't understand it herself. Why did I shake so when I was introduced to Mac? He was nice right from the start. Later that evening, she felt better, more relaxed. Mac was different. He was friendly and understanding. He had hardly left her all evening. There was something sincere and kind about him. He was cute and funny, but he was also gentle and good-natured. He seemed safe. But maybe I was a little forward when it came to making a date with him. Maybe I pushed him into it. Maybe I should have refused a few times to make sure he really wanted to. Maybe left to himself, he never would have asked for my number. But that evening, it didn't seem very important. I was so relaxed and having such a good time. And the good time became a wonderful time in the weeks that followed. Spring weeks. Young weeks when she felt beautiful and charming and happy. She had a man to herself again. She was happy. So happy she couldn't believe it would last. She didn't really deserve it, she felt. But soon they were sort of going steady. Parties, dances, and after dances, sometimes a little ride to get some air. When I asked, did Mac love her? She was sure he did then. There were so many proofs. He was so loving, so tender, so sweet. We had such wonderful times together. I wanted to be his wife, to love him forever. And he wanted me, he wanted me very much. Sometimes too much. At such times, she says she felt disgusted and wanted to cry. She never says afraid. They kept on seeing each other all that spring. Carolyn was sure she was in love. She couldn't stand being away from him. Even a few minutes made a tremendous difference. 
I hated waiting, hated it. And I was so glad when it was over. I wanted to scold him and kiss him all at once. There were little arguments, she remembers. He said, she said kind of arguments. He might have dressed for a ride when she had dressed for the movies because the weather had been uncertain. When I wanted to change, he said it wasn't necessary. We could go to the movies if I wanted to. But he wanted a ride and, and I pleaded, let's go for a ride. I only wanted to please him to do whatever he wanted to do. <sighs> Why couldn't I ever get it right? But he didn't understand. He thought I was making a fuss about nothing. Many of their dates turned into arguments over nothing. And then it happened, late one fall afternoon, when, as usual, she was waiting for Mac outside the office. I just had to get out of there. I couldn't stand meeting him. I couldn't stand seeing his face. I never wanted to see him again. Did you hate him, I asked? No. I loved him. That's why I didn't know what to do. Running, escaping, fine. But where to? <sighs> I couldn't stand him, and I couldn't stand myself. There was nothing. No one. No place. She didn't want to go to her lonely room. She couldn't face friends who would only laugh at her for losing her man. They had probably been laughing at her all the time. How could she keep a man? She isn't sure where she went that evening. It was just away, away from Mac, away from happiness, away from the future. There was to be no future for her. Things would always be the same. She would always be alone. By the time the sun was going down, she had reached the other side of town. Some park or playground, she didn't know where she was. She was lost, alone and lost and helpless. Why did he do it to me? Didn't I love him enough? Was there something wrong with the way I loved him? But it grew dark and it grew cold. And no one came to take her home, lovingly in his arms. Although she was grown up now, she was still only playing at being a grown woman. I couldn't stay in the park forever. Somewhere I found the energy to start home, by myself.
She realized she was hungry now, very hungry, and remembered a restaurant on the way. But when she got there, the lights, the people, their talking and laughing were too much for her. Months before, I'd seen a movie in which a French war widow followed her husband's coffin. I felt like that woman now. But it seemed to be my own coffin I was following. And worst of all, there was that terrible feeling that somehow or other she had been responsible for the death. She, Carolyn, was the guilty one. She had done something to Mac, and at the same time, she had done something to herself, something terrible. <laughs> Alone, bereft again, but now there is no one to wait for. No one would be coming home. <laughs> there was someone, the girl who lived in the next room. She'd heard crying and wanted to help, but she was the wrong person. Carolyn didn't want her shame revealed. Besides, who could understand her problem? Who would believe how different she was? For hours through the night, she wallowed helplessly in the quagmire of self-contempt. Her looks, her hair, her lack of charm, her stupidity. How did I ever think I could fool him? How did I dare to hope? He's been so wonderful, so kind to me. He wanted me. He did want me. I know that. But it's over now. He doesn't want me anymore. No one wants me. No one. No one, no one. No one. I had to stop those words. That's when I thought of the sleeping pills. Just to stop the sound of my thoughts, that's all. Just to stop. No one. What are you thinking about? just the same as I always was. I'm miserable. I'm lonely. I'll never be any different. I was born this way and nothing can change me. You mean you don't want to change? What I want doesn't mean anything. I am what I am. What are you? Told me that. I'm Carolyn. Failure. I'm sick. Does that mean that you're going to stay sick? There, you see. Even you say I'm sick. Down in your heart, you know it's hopeless. All this time, all this trying for nothing. I am hopeless. I want to die. I will die. I can't go on like this.
I'll kill myself. And then I won't be wasting your time anymore. Is that why you want to kill yourself? Because of me? No. Because I'm hopeless. Maybe it is because of me. Maybe it's a way of proving that I can't help you. If you were very angry at me, it would be a good way of getting back at me, wouldn't it? Yes, so. And you are angry with me, aren't you? I'm angry at myself. And me too? I guess so. Do you know why? Because I don't seem to be getting any better. And so you want to punish me? I guess so. And you wanted to punish Mac. Were you angry with him, too? Oh, maybe, but... But I didn't try to kill myself then. You know that. That was an accident. You know, I really didn't want to kill myself. But you did want to punish him, didn't you? Oh, maybe, but... What? Why? Yes? Why didn't I hurt him instead of myself? Why are you trying to hurt yourself now, when you really want to hurt me? Because I don't really want to hurt you. I couldn't hurt you. Because you're afraid I'll get angry and stop treatment? Maybe. And you'd be alone again. Is that what you're afraid of? Admitting her fear of being alone is possible now. Because Carolyn has found within herself some of the inner strength we all need to face that fact. As treatment continues, her strength should gradually increase until she can stop seeing me and can accept the responsibility of living with her feelings. When we learn to accept our feelings, as Carolyn is now learning, we can use them to bring us closer to other people instead of separating us from them. For we all live with our feelings. We live in groups and families because we need other people to work with and live with. Because we have feelings about them and they have feelings about us. Children need the love that grown-ups need to give. All childhood is a growing time. Learning to venture forth among strangers, learning to get along with others, acquiring the skills that feed our pride and sense of accomplishment, coming to know ourselves, learning to live with people, instead of against them, or in spite of them. Some of us still have it to learn, even when we're adults. And some of us, like Carolyn, must go directly to psychiatry for help in understanding our tangled feelings, for help in working out our day-to-day -day relations with the people in our lives. But Carolyn is not being made over into a new person. She'll always be Carolyn. Psychiatry, like a good childhood, can only help her be herself more fully, more satisfactorily. Help her to learn to laugh, to love, to cry, to hate at the right time. To accept her weakness and enjoy her strength. A lesson she's late in learning. For this is the morning when the day begins. This is the child where the person begins. the child are all the inner needs that must be fed and satisfied. Allowed to blossom, encouraged to grow, 
the child naturally moves towards strength and maturity. This is the time, the easy time, to prevent most of the pain and suffering and human waste that we call mental illness. In the child are all the forces that can explode into misery. But the child, understood and loved and respected, will not easily yield to the pressures of life. It is a good time to have help at hand. For we cannot grow unless we feel secure and confident. And confidence only develops as we prove our worth to ourselves and the people who love us. This is the place to start making a person, here in brightness and sun, in the beginning. He can pick up habits of fear or habits of courage. He can learn to depend on violence or on reason. He can learn to withdraw into himself or to move out toward people. This is the time to build against the loneliness of the night. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.